The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss Step 1. D is for definition. 2. Rules that change the rules. Everything popular is wrong. Beating the game, not playing the game. In 1999, sometime after quitting my second unfulfilling job and eating peanut butter sandwiches for comfort, I won the gold medal at the Chinese kickboxing Sanshu National Championships. It wasn't because I was good at punching and kicking. God forbid, that seemed a bit dangerous, considering I did it on a dare and had four weeks of preparation. Besides, I have a watermelon head. It's a big target. I won by reading the rules and looking for unexploited opportunities, of which there were two. 1. Weigh-ins were the day prior to competition. Using dehydration techniques commonly practiced by elite powerlifters and Olympic wrestlers, I lost 20 pounds in 18 hours, weighed in at 165 pounds, and then hyperhydrated back to 193 pounds. It's hard to fight someone from three weight classes above you. Poor little guys. 2. There was a technicality in the fine print. If one combatant fell off the elevated platform three times in a single round, his opponent won by default. I decided to use this technicality as my principal technique and push people off. As you might imagine, this did not make the judges the happiest Chinese I've ever seen. The result? I won all of my matches by technical knockout, TKO, and went home national champion, something 99% of those with 5 to 10 years of experience had been unable to do. But isn't pushing people out of the ring pushing the boundaries of ethics? Not at all. It's no more than doing the uncommon within the rules. The important distinction is that between official rules and self-imposed rules. Consider the following example from the official website of the Olympic movement. www.olympic.org The 1968 Mexico City Olympics marked the international debut of Dick Fosbury and his celebrated Fosbury flop, which would soon revolutionize high jumping. At the time, jumpers swung their outside foot up and over the bar, called the straddle, much like a hurdle jump. It allowed you to land on your feet. Fosbury's technique began by racing up to the bar at great speed and taking off from his right, or outside foot. Then he twisted his body so that he went over the bar headfirst with his back to the bar. While the coaches of the world shook their heads in disbelief, the Mexico City audience was absolutely captivated by Fosbury and shouted, Ole, as he cleared the bar. Fosbury cleared every height through 2.2 meters without a miss and then achieved a personal record of 2.24 meters to win the gold medal. By 1980, 13 of the 16 Olympic finalists were using the Fosbury flop. The weight cutting techniques and off-platform throwing I used are now standard features of Sanshu competition. I didn't cause it, I just foresaw it as inevitable, as did others who tested this superior approach. Now it's par for the course. Sports evolve when sacred cows are killed, when basic assumptions are tested. The same is true in life and in lifestyles. Challenging the status quo versus being stupid. Most people walk down the street on their legs. Does that mean I walk down the street on my hands? Do I wear my underwear outside of my pants in the name of being different? Not usually, no. Then again, walking on my legs and keeping my thong on the inside have worked just fine thus far. I don't fix it if it isn't broken. Different is better when it is more effective or more fun. If everyone is defining a problem or solving it one way and the results are subpar, this is the time to ask, what if I did the opposite? Don't follow a model that doesn't work. If the recipe sucks, it doesn't matter how good a cook you are. When I was in data storage sales, my first gig out of college, I realized that most cold calls didn't get to the intended person for one reason, gatekeepers. If I simply made all my calls from 8 to 8.30 a.m. and 6 to 6.30 p.m., 
For a total of one hour, I was able to avoid secretaries and book more than twice as many meetings as the senior sales executives who called from nine to five. In other words, I got twice the results for one eighth the time. From Japan to Monaco, from globetrotting single mothers to multimillionaire race car drivers, the basic rules of successful new rich are surprisingly uniform and predictably divergent from what the rest of the world is doing. The following rules are the fundamental differentiators to keep in mind throughout this book. 1. Retirement is worst case scenario insurance. Retirement planning is like life insurance. It should be viewed as nothing more than a hedge against the absolute worst case scenario, in this case becoming physically incapable of working and needing a reservoir of capital to survive. Retirement as a goal or final redemption is flawed for at least three solid reasons. A. It is predicated on the assumption that you dislike what you are doing during the most physically capable years of your life. This is a non-starter. Nothing can justify that sacrifice. B. Most people will never be able to retire and maintain even a hot dogs for dinner standard of living. Even 1 million is chump change in a world where traditional retirement could span 30 years and inflation lowers your purchasing power, 2-4% to 4 per year. The math doesn't work. The golden years become lower middle class life revisited. That's a bittersweet ending. C. If the math does work, it means that you are one ambitious hardworking machine. If that's the case, guess what? One week into retirement, you'll be so damn bored that you'll want to stick bicycle spokes in your eyes. You'll probably opt to look for a new job or start another company. Kind of defeats the purpose of waiting, doesn't it? I'm not saying don't plan for the worst case. I have maxed out 401ks and IRAs I use primarily for tax purposes. But don't mistake retirement for the goal. 2. Interest and energy are cyclical. If I offered you $10 million to work 24 hours a day for 15 years and then retire, would you do it? Of course not. You couldn't. It is unsustainable, just as what most define as a career. Doing the same thing for 8 plus hours per day until you break down or have enough cash to permanently stop. How else can my 30-year-old friends all look like a cross between Donald Trump and Joan Rivers? It's horrendous. Premature aging fueled by triple bypass frappuccinos and impossible workloads. Alternating periods of activity and rest is necessary to survive, let alone thrive. Capacity, interest, and mental endurance all wax and wane. Plan accordingly. The new rich aims to distribute mini retirements throughout life instead of hoarding the recovery and enjoyment for the fool's gold of retirement. By working only when you are most effective, life is both more productive and more enjoyable. It's the perfect example of having your cake and eating it too. Personally, I now aim for one month of overseas relocation or high-intensity learning, tango, fighting, whatever, for every two months of work projects. 3. Less is not laziness. Doing less meaningless work so that you can focus on things of greater personal importance is not laziness. This is hard for most to accept because our culture tends to reward personal sacrifice instead of personal productivity. Few people choose to, or are able to, measure the results of their actions and thus measure their contribution in time. More time equals more self-worth and more reinforcement from those above and around them. The new rich, despite fewer hours in the office, produce more meaningful results than the next dozen non-rich combined. Let's define laziness anew. To endure a non-ideal existence. To let circumstance or others decide life for you. Or to amass a fortune while passing through life, like a spectator from an office window. The size of your bank account doesn't change this, nor does the number of hours you log in handling unimportant email or minutia. Focus on being productive instead of busy. 4. 
The timing is never right. I once asked my mom how she decided when to have her first child, let alone me. The answer was simple. It was something we wanted, and we decided there was no point in putting it off. The timing is never right to have a baby. And so it is. For all of the most important things, the timing always sucks. Waiting for a good time to quit your job? The stars will never align and the traffic lights of life will never all be green at the same time. The universe doesn't conspire against you, but it doesn't go out of its way to line up all the pins either. Conditions are never perfect. Someday is a disease that will take your dreams to the grave with you. Pro and con lists are just as bad. If it's important to you and you want to do it, eventually, just do it and correct course along the way. 5. Ask for forgiveness, not permission. If it isn't going to devastate those around you, try it and then justify it. People, whether parents, partners or bosses, deny things on an emotional basis that they can learn to accept after the fact. If the potential damage is moderate or in any way reversible, don't give people the chance to say no. Most people are fast to stop you before you get started, but hesitant to get in the way if you're moving. Get good at being a troublemaker and saying sorry when you really screw up. 6. Emphasize strengths, don't fix weaknesses. Most people are good at a handful of things and utterly miserable at most. I'm great at product creation and marketing, but terrible at most of the things that follow. My body is designed to lift heavy objects and throw them, and that's it. I ignored this for a long time. I tried swimming and looked like a drowning monkey. I tried basketball and looked like a caveman. Then I became a fighter and took off. It is far more lucrative and fun to leverage your strengths instead of attempting to fix all the chinks in your armor. The choice is between multiplication of results, using strengths or incremental improvement, fixing weakness that will, at best, become mediocre. Focus on better use of your best weapons instead of constant repair. 7. Things in excess become their opposite. It is possible to have too much of a good thing. In excess, most endeavors and possessions take on the characteristics of their opposite. Thus, pacifists become militants, freedom fighters become tyrants, blessings become curses, help becomes hindrance, more becomes less. Too much, too many, and too often of what you want becomes what you don't want. This is true of possessions and even time. Lifestyle design is thus not interested in creating an excess of idle time, which is poisonous, but the positive use of free time, defined simply as doing what you want, as opposed to what you feel obligated to do. 8. Money alone is not the solution. There is much to be said for the power of money as currency. I'm a fan myself. But adding more of it just isn't the answer as often as we'd like to think. In part, it's laziness. If only I had more money is the easiest way to postpone the intense self-examination and decision-making necessary to create a life of enjoyment, now and not later. By using money as the scapegoat and work as our all-consuming routine, we're able to conveniently disallow ourselves the time to do otherwise. John, I'd love to talk about the gaping void I feel in my life, the hopelessness that hits me like a punch in the eye every time I start my computer in the morning, but I have so much work to do. I've got at least three hours of unimportant email to reply to before calling the prospects who said no yesterday. Gotta run. Busy yourself with the routine of the money wheel. Pretend it's the fix-all and your art flea create a constant distraction that prevents you from seeing just how pointless it is. Deep down, you know it's all an illusion, but with everyone participating in the same game of make-believe, it's easy to forget. The problem is more than money. 9. Relative income is more important than absolute income. Among dietitians and nutritionists, there is some debate over the value of a calorie. Is a calorie a calorie, much like a rose is a rose? 
Is fat loss as simple as expending more calories than you consume or is the source of those calories important? Based on work with top athletes, I know the answer to be the latter. What about income? Is a dollar, is a dollar, is a dollar? The new rich don't think so. Let's look at this like a fifth grade math problem. Two hardworking chaps are headed toward each other. Chap A moving at 80 hours per week and chap B moving at 10 hours per week. They both make $50,000 per year. Who will be richer when they pass in the middle of the night? If you said B, you would be correct. And this is the difference between absolute and relative income. Absolute income is measured using one holy and inalterable variable, the raw and almighty dollar. Jane Doe makes $100,000 per year and is thus twice as rich as John Doe, who makes $50,000 per year. Relative income uses two variables, the dollar and time, usually hours. The whole per year concept is arbitrary and makes it easy to trick yourself. Let's look at the real trade. Jane Doe makes $100,000 per year, $2,000 for each of 50 weeks per year, and works 80 hours per week. Jane Doe thus makes $25 per hour. John Doe makes $50,000 per year, $1,000 for each of 50 weeks per year, but works 10 hours per week and hence makes hundred dollars per hour. In relative income, John is four times richer. Of course, relative income has to add up to the minimum amount necessary to actualize your goals. If I make a hundred dollars per hour but only work one hour per week, it's going to be hard for me to run amok like a superstar, assuming that the total absolute income is where it needs to be to live my dreams, not an arbitrary point of comparison with the Joneses. Relative income is the real measurement of wealth for the new rich. The top new rich mavericks make at least $5,000 per hour. Out of college, I started about $5. I'll get you closer to the former. 10. Distress is bad. You stress is good. Unbeknownst to most fun-loving bipeds, not all stress is bad. Indeed, the new rich don't aim to eliminate all stress, not in the least. There are two separate types of stress, each as different as euphoria and its seldom mentioned opposite, dysphoria. Distress refers to harmful stimuli that makes you weaker, less confident and less able. Destructive criticism abusive bosses and smashing your face on a curb are examples of this. These are things we want to avoid. Use stress, on the other hand, is a word most of you have probably never heard. You, a Greek prefix for healthy, is used in the same sense in the word euphoria. Role models who push us to exceed our limits, physical training that removes our spare tires, and risks that expand our sphere of Comfortable action are all examples of use stress. Stress that is helpful and the stimulus for growth. People who avoid all criticism fail. It's destructive criticism we need to avoid, not criticism in all forms. Similarly, there is no progress without use stress. And the more use stress we can create or apply to our lives, the sooner we can actualize our dreams. The trick is telling the two apart. The new rich are equally aggressive in removing distress and finding eustress. Q&A questions and actions. 1. How has being realistic or responsible kept you from the life you want? 2. How has doing what you should resulted in subpar experiences or regret for not having done something else? 3. Look at what you're currently doing and ask yourself, what would happen if I did the opposite of the people around me? What will I sacrifice if I continue on this track for 5, 10 or 20 years? End of chapter 1, part 2.